Hello everyone, welcome back to the podcast and I'd like to get into a bit more philosophy. Um, not sure if we're going to do that much on the spiritual side but we'll see how it goes. And today I want to talk about uh, the idea that we might live in a computer simulation. That this world that we see could be actually a computer simulation like a very elaborate video game generated by an extremely advanced computer and um, I think this is a very clever theory um, a philosopher called Nick Bostrom who is I believe the chairman of the Oxford University philosophy department uh, Nick Bostrom is the guy that's most recently sort of come up with a very um, well thought out and well argued argument for this. So there's, let me go into a bit of the scientific background. Um, there has been some evidence that perhaps this universe is, is, is an information universe rather than what we used to think it was an energetic universe and what we thought before was that it was a material universe. So basically Newton and the classical physics was this is a machine, this is a material universe. And then with Einstein and quantum physics we started to see it more as an energetic system. Um, that matter is energy equals mc squared the famous Einstein equation, E equals mc squared. And yeah, and then now we're starting to move towards this, a lot of physicists and other thinkers are starting to move towards the idea that this universe might be, in fact, an information universe. And, you know, and now we're starting to see some philosophical theories about how this could be true. And that brings me to Nick Bostrom's paper now I'm not you know, an expert on their paper and I'm sure it's very well argued and I'm not going to go into too much technical depth on the paper but what I will explain is roughly the theory as far as I understand it. So basically the theory is that we can see that our own culture is creating better and better, faster and faster, and more and more capable computing machines. And um, these are exponentially growing in terms of their power. I mean, <laughs> I was looking at a picture on the internet the other day of this uh, massive great object being loaded onto an aeroplane. And um, apparently this was a five megabyte drive. And I think this was back in the 60s. And now, of course, you can get a tiny little thing with a thousand times as much data capacity. So that's the kind of growth we're looking at. And if you project that growth into the future, you're talking about machines that um, really mind-blowing capacity. So basically, and also what, what Nixon noticed is that we are... Um, now using those machines to create ever more elaborate simulations like video games or you know with a supercomputer they simulate you know the weather and even social things they can simulate like traffic or, or even how people might interact economics and this kind of thing and they are trying to simulate that and they're, they're getting more and more good at doing those simulations and they're more and more accurate to the world apparently <laughs> I'm not so sure with the climate ones but anyway um, you put like any other computer system if you put garbage in you get garbage out giggo garbage in garbage out but that doesn't detract from the fact that these simulations are extremely powerful and complex and, and sophisticated and down to a very small resolution and um, so if we project all that you know, in the future we will be able to simulate a universe, you know, within the computer, a whole universe. And in fact, from what we can tell, the universe runs on some fairly simple rules. 
Um, so if you can, you know, let's assume that physics um, eventually finds all those rules, or at least most of the obvious ones, and then, you know, we could simulate this universe and it would be indistinguishable from this very universe that we're experiencing now. Um, so presumably you could put on a, you could get into a very sophisticated device that would detach you from your body and would immerse you in that universe and you might not even know that that's happened. You know, you might go to sleep, somebody might you know, drug you, put you in this machine, hook you up to this super simulation of the universe and arrange everything so it's exactly the same or as close to as, as they could and then see whether you notice a difference, leave you in there for a year or two see, and then ask you, did you notice any difference, you know, and you might not. So this is where it's going. Now, Nick Bostrom then goes on to say, right, if we have done this, or we are going this direction, if we can foresee that this is what's going to happen, what about other races? Now, you know, it's a big universe. Um, the likelihood that there are other races in the universe is pretty high. So, presumably, this could have happened before. That, that in the past, in the millions of years, maybe in the past, perhaps even billions of years, I mean, the universe has been around, as far as we can tell, for 14 billion years. And I want you to just make a note of this part of the argument. Yeah? Just remember this part. So, this could have happened before. Now, this could have happened billions of years ago. And in fact, it's most likely that it did happen billions of years ago. And, not, and we're not the first to do this. Right, so if we accept that, what about this? If an alien race, billions of years ago, set up computer simulations, highly sophisticated computer simulations, who's to say we're not one of those simulations? Or who's to say we're not one of the simulations inside the simulation? So we're going towards this culture where we can simulate within this simulation, if we assume it is a simulation. Maybe that's happened many times before, that there's whole generations of simulations, a whole tree, a whole ancestry of all these different simulations over billions of years, leading to cultures, leading to whole universes where new cultures come into existence and eventually reach our level of technology or a bit past that and start doing simulations lead to another universe yeah um, and that if you look at the probabilities it's actually more probable because there's probably a lot more universes that exist in simulation than they are than they exist in reality this is again something to note here that Therefore, we're more likely to be in a simulated universe. So, you know, this isn't proof, this is just uh, pointing to the fact that it wouldn't be unreasonable for us to say, to ask the question, are we in a simulated universe? And he's right. It's not unreasonable to ask that question. And he's put forward... Um, a plausible logical argument for um, for saying that could be possible. Um, establishing how possible and how probable it is is a bit difficult as you can imagine because how do we assess the likelihood of um, of this? You know, given that we don't know how many simulated universes there might be versus how many unsimulated ones etc. But anyway, the, the probability is, is, is it's not impossible and it's, it's possible, I would say, from his argument, uh, from what we know. Yeah. Now obviously there's one big assumption there and that is that um, a computer can simulate consciousness. And this comes about because most scientists think that 
the brain is a computer and, and that consciousness arises in the brain and therefore um, any computer sophisticated as the brain might well become conscious itself which is again not unreasonable um, given what we understand and as I've gone into in other videos we actually don't understand a great deal about the brain and consciousness but anyway it's not unreasonable to argue that I think um, and that one day highly sophisticated computer simulations might be conscious I think is possible as well um, so okay now another way another great explanation for how consciousness arises comes about from a man called um, um, Chalmers I can't remember his first name Dave David Chalmers David Chalmers um, has a very clever he's a philosopher from from Australia has a very clever um, theory about how consciousness arises in the universe or in fact it doesn't arise he, he has the idea that um, that matter has a duality in it that it is partly consciousness and partly um, material that all matter is like this um, and that the fact that we are conscious is just a fact of the, the simple fact that we are material that we're made of material and everything material is conscious um, not conscious to the level that a human being is because a human being has all this sophisticated complex machinery <laughs> computers to, to to make that consciousness really function as, as it does in us um, and so again this would work with this theory because obviously in a simulation um, at some level it's in a physical realm there is a physical computer somewhere in some you know universe many many simulations back from where we are perhaps many millions of simulations back from where we are that is actually running this all and probably that whole universe is one has been turned into one big computer somehow um, now this is very interesting and obviously for someone who, who does believe in God this presents a bit of a challenge because in a way this seems to be saying these aliens are taking the role of God the first aliens that created a computer and created a system <laughs> to turn the whole universe into a computer um, are, they are the, the ones that created our reality um, and um, of course it doesn't actually bypass the whole question because where did they come from where did the, where did the original the original aliens come from yeah that's still the same same problem <laughs> if we're the original aliens or they are you know even if even if we put it back billions of years and millions of simulations generations of simulation we still have the same issue where did they come from originally and what was their meaning and purpose going on to my original uh, my, my recent video on that so um so where did the oas come from it doesn't answer that does it because they can't be simulated they must be real now there is a as i pointed out there was a point where we need to remember there's an assumption coming in here that um the universe from which the OAs come is very similar to our universe and why is it very similar to our universe that's a bit of an assumption isn't it I mean with our own level of technology we already create universes that are very different than ours you know where people can teleport maybe we will in the future but where you know I mean, you look at some of the game realms where there are fantasy games, where magic can happen, where time can stand still, be reversed, and 
all sorts of things that we don't know are possible in this universe. And I think it's reasonable to assume that um, as we become more sophisticated, we might simulate very different universes, ones that are maybe have other dimensions than we have in this one. Um, we certainly simulated ones with lower dimensions, like two-dimensional universes, like Pac-Man. It's a kind of two-dimensional universe. A very unsophisticated one, of course. But, you know, if we apply the same, the same kind of extrapolations that Nick Bostrom applies to, you know, computing power, to the complexity and originality and variety of simulations we might run, I think it's reasonable to say we might run all sorts of things that are not at all like this universe. And therefore, do we know whether the OAs lived in a universe like ours? Like, especially if we're millions of universes away from uh, you, millions of generations of simulation from the original, from the OAs, um, couldn't we be com in a completely different sort of universe now? Um, and this is where God can creep back in, because do we even know whether the OAs lived in a temporal universe? Do we know that they had time? I mean, this would explain how they've got enormous computing power if they don't even live in a temporal zone. Like, there's no time, there's absolutely no limit to how much processing their computer can do. Because there's no time. And so the time is part of the simulation. And, um, and we can also say, well, do, do they live in a spatial universe or a three-dimensional universe? Is there space at all? And if there's no space, then you can't have a computer the way we understand it. So if there's no time and space, what you're left with is consciousness. That's the only other thing that we know of that exists. It might be, it might exist in the physical world, it might not. But at least it's got the possibility of being not spatial and not physical. So perhaps the OA is a singular and is God. So is is a consciousness, you know, God or source, if you prefer, um, is a consciousness that lives in a timeless and non-spatial realm and it is the true simulator, it is simulating the universe. And it is itself conscious, so of course, in a way, David Chalmers would be right that all things that are material are also conscious. And in fact, perhaps they're only conscious, there is no material. And that's going back to my discussion of, you know, um, the nature of the universe in various videos. Um, you can have a look at those that perhaps the, the universe is only exists in consciousness because we only have evidence for that. And so, so in a way, um, maybe Nick Bostrom's theory is not pointing to any physical aliens, could be pointing to a completely different dimension and, a, and a, a sort of consciousness that might come under the name of God or source. Now, there will probably be many objections to what I'm saying here, um, and um, I'll be interested to hear them, interested to discuss it. Um, but um, that's um, that's the uh, video for now. Thanks for watching. Bye.